All right, so I just want to make sure everyone has the separate handout for this session. Does anyone not have the handout? Okay, great. So we're going to start in. So this is about implementation uh, and preparing for the audit. We're going to talk a little bit about the accounting, what's required in the disclosure, a little bit of redundancy with, with, with what Mary Beth had just gone over. Um, and as Mary Beth had said, earlier, this is very similar, you know, very similar to the process for GASB 68. So the disclosures are not that much different. You take your old disclosures, you add in the new requirements, and you're good to go. So here's an overview of what we're going to talk about. I'm going to skip over uh, the overview of GASB 75 because Mary Beth, Mary Beth covered that very well. We're going to talk about employer responsibilities for the accounting, your net OPEB liability or asset or your total OPEB liability, deferred inflows and outflows again, note disclosures and required supplementary information, journal entry resources, and then closing checklist requirements. So you want to know what we're going to ask for. So this is the part that I'm going to just breeze over uh, and go over these first few, or excuse me, avoid these first few slides. Uh, discount rate. And so here we're going we're gonna to skip right into the employer responsibilities. So I am on slide, I should tell you this, starting on slide 11, okay? So as the employer, what you're responsible for, so this is, so 75 is being implemented after statement 74. 74 is the plan was required to implement statement 74, have their audited net fiduciary net position so that you as the employer are ready to implement in the subsequent year with Statement 75. So for Statement 75, you as the employer, you're required to determine the measurement date. It can be any date, as it can be a date as of your fiscal year end or up to one year prior to your fiscal year end. So if you participate in a plan that happens to have a December 31st plan year end, your measurement date might be 12-31-17. Am I going to get my rate dates right? You could have a measurement date of June 30, 18. You could have a measurement date of June 30, 17. So somewhere in those in that range is going to be your measurement date. Your other responsibilities include obtaining a GASB 74-75 compliant actuarial valuation and or a roll forward, because you can use a valuation for up to two years, but the measurement, excuse me, the uh, total OPEB liability needs to be measured as of your fiscal year end or no more than one year prior to your fiscal year end. So depending on the timing of your actuarial valuation, you may have, need to have that liability rolled forward. Who rolls it forward? Not you, not us. Your actuary rolls that, forward, that information forward for you. And if your plan includes implicit subsidy or implied subsidy, the actuary is the one that's going to determine the contributions that are going to be included in your disclosures and your, and your accruals for the um, contributions subsequent to the measurement date and any use of the impli implied subsidy numbers. Oops, sorry, I advanced too quickly. So the other responsibilities that you have are to determine the allocation met methodology for your governmental activities and your proprietary funds. So unlike pensions, most entities that we've encountered so far, when you're determining the allocate, how to allocate the pension liability, most of our clients are using contributions to, to the pension plan as that basis for determining the allocation between your proprietary funds, your governmental activities, and the department, and then the governmental departments. But with OPEB, the actual contributions may not be reflective of the liability. You may have a number of more retirees in one department than you are contributing to the plan currently. So contributions may not be a, an, a reasonable basis for determining the allocation of your liability. There is, there is no rule as to how you should determine that allocation, but it should be reasonable, it should have a, you know, it should be supportable and make sense for you. Now, once you'd establish that, that basis in year one, if you find in the future that a different basis makes sense for you, it's okay to change. It'd be a, it, wouldn't it wouldn't require um, a change, a restatement. It would be a change in accounting policy. Now you're going to implement this new change of the allocation, but you shouldn't be changing it every year. It's something you should stick with and go on a go forward basis, but it's okay after you get through this to, to change that allocation in the future. So then your other responsibilities include to record that note OPEB liability or total OPEB liability and related deferred inflows and outflows. And then of course you're required to um, disclose, up, you can include your footnote disclosure and uh, required supplementary information. So some key dates. So if you're, if you're, I'm going to work backward on this slide. So if your employer fiscal year end is June 30, 18, the 
earliest measurement date you could use, because you could use a June 30, 18 measurement date if you're a single employer plan uh, or a plan which the, um, uh, like if you have a plan that it doesn't have, is not funded through a trust, that would be your measurement date is gonna be your fiscal year end because you're not waiting for that trust information. But the earliest measurement date you could use would be one year prior. June 30, 17 would be your measurement date for your June 30, 18 financial statements. So then we have June 30, 16 in the middle and your earliest valuation that could be used for a June 30, 17 measurement date would be 12, 31, 15. But it would have to be rolled forward to that measurement date. Most of you, um, because of the timing, most have um, actual valuations that are fresher than that, and you're not going to be using one so old. But this kind of shows you the oldest version that you could be using for your, to record your, or to calculate your liability for this year's implementation. Uh, and something else that's new with the actual valuation, so to, under the old rules, the pre-74 and 75 rules, your actuarial valuation was required two, every two or every three years, depending on the size of your plan participants. Now that, that rule has gone away and, and valuations are required every two years regardless of the size of your plan. And it's valuation, or you could use the alternative measurement method that is an option. I think, as we said, there was only one person in the room, if I remember right, that was using the alternative measurement method. So it's not too common. But, it's, but the calculations are required every two years. Okay. So for agent multiple employer plans, your other responsibilities include uh, the census data. So you're required to verify the completeness, completeness and accuracy of the census data. That's the data that you provide to the actuary to prepare your um, actuarial valuation and calculate the total, total OPEB liability. You're supposed to re reconcile that data to your records. You want to make sure that it's accurate. Even if that data is being requested from CalPERS and then provided to the actuary, you're still responsible for that data as a whole. Uh, other responsibilities include the financial statements, establishing a financial reporting process to ensure that the controls over the measurement of, its, of your specific OPEB amounts. Even though you're getting, it from, getting the data from the actuary, you need to make sure that all of the inputs are accurate. Does the discount rate make sense? Does, do the other assumptions, are the benefit plans, the plan information, did you forget to tell them about one of your OPEB plans? Or did the data get transposed when it got into the actuarial evaluation? Did they miss an MOU? Did they miss some of the benefits or some recent changes that you may have made? And you want to make sure that all of those assumptions then in the actuarial evaluations are supported and reasonable and specific to your plan. So for single employer plans, very similar to the agent plans, again, you're responsible for the census data accuracy, the actuarial assumptions again, and the financial reporting, and then evaluating the information for disclosure. So very, very similar. I'm not even going to cover cost sharing plans because it, it, it also falls under those same rules, but, but because I don't think anyone, does, is anyone in here uh, have a cost sharing plan? Oh, we do have one cost sharing plan. So I'll cover them when I, when I go over the deferred inflows and outflows. I was going to ignore them completely, but I won't do that now. <laughs> but the data, so it, when you're in a cost sharing plan, that's going to be where the plan itself is going to be issuing the information necessary for you to um, include the disclosures, make your, make your, record your liabilities and do those calculations from that data. So that, so they will be issuing, I assume the plan will be issuing um, audited financial data from which you will record those, uh, that information from, very similar to the, the CalPERS reports, some accounting valuation information. So other information, preparing for the audit. So as you prepare for the audit, you want to make sure that you're, you're ready when we ask for that census data. And we're going to be performing census data testing. So you want to have those personnel records uh, ready and available for the active and the inactive employees. If you have inactive employees are those that have recently retired and not yet receiving benefits that might be in the, getting them in the future, and have the current and prior census data available for us. Um, for signal and agent plans, we're going to test employees newly eligible for, for enrollment and inclusion in the census data. We pick those employees during that. Now, what we're looking at is we're testing for the what valuation is being used for your total OPEB liability. So if your, OP, if your actuarial valuation is dated June 30, 16, and it's been rolled forward to, to calculate your liability, we're going to be testing that census data for the June 30, 16 period. So we're going to be testing, selecting employees that were newly eligible during that fiscal year, not the current fiscal year. So that's where it can get a little confusing on which data is 
um, is required to be available. And something else um, to, to be aware of and something we've run into is some of these plans where you're relying on, on CalPERS or CERBIT to have all of that data in their, in their records and you're just getting the census data from them and you may not have some of the data on file or the, some of the records on file. They may have been purged based on your, for retirees, based on your um, record retention policy. That's something you want to start looking at possibly amending your records retention policy because still the census data is your responsibility and the accuracy. So you need to at least retain enough information to show that the person was your employee and is eligible to receive the benefits and included in the census data. So that's, it doesn't mean you have to retain the entire census, or excuse me, entire personnel file, but at least enough information to show you know, their hire date, their eligibility for receiving the benefits and whatever other information would be necessary to show that. Okay. So for single employer plans, we're also gonna, again, same testing, we're gonna test the active employees for eligibility, the newly eligible, and we're also gonna compare the prior census data to the current census data, looking for any significant variances and supporting documentation for those changes. You know, does it make sense that there was a, a huge change in the number of retired participants or the benefits that they're receiving or the, the head count? Does the ha head count make sense one way or the other if it swings high or low? Did you have a number of layoffs? So we're looking for the reasonableness of that and supporting documentation. So when you're preparing for the audit, these are some of the things you want to prepare uh, for us, so you want to prepare a list of status changes reported to the plan. Did you have any, uh, you know, MOU revisions? You've you've adopted new, um, new benefits, new plans, new changes. You're having you you implemented a an early retirement plan program. So you're going to have a number of retirees coming into the plan. What are those changes that you've reported to the plan? And then we're going to trace a sample of those changes to the to the supporting documentation. Again active employee testing for eligibility, and then the plan itself, when you're talking about an agent plan, the plan itself should provide evidence of completeness and accuracy of the census data if they're maintaining, if the plan is maintaining that census data. Uh, the current agent, the current um, agent multiple employer plans include CERBT and PARS, but I know there's there are gonna be others out there, but the difference between the two is that under CERBT, CERBT, in your agreement with them, they are the plan administrator. They have agreed to be the plan administrator for that agent multiple employer plan. Under the PARS plans, you are actually the plan administrator. So that's where you are responsible for all of that plan reporting. They are providing you with the information to complete that plan reporting. CERBT is taking it upon themselves to prepare and issue those reports. And CERBT implemented Statement 74 last year. PARS did not. PARS said, we will provide information for you to do to do the plan reporting because that difference of the even though they're both the trust are both agent multiple employer trusts one is it's the plan administration difference so you as the plan administrator are um, required to include that disclosure in your financials for the pars plans it can get a little confusing because they they seem like the same the same type of plan so any and any questions along the way please feel free to ask them it's not a problem. Um, so no, net OPEB liability or asset or total OPEB liability, when do you disclose? What, what do you have? So if you have established a trust, then you have a net OPEB liability. You have assets to offset that total OPEB liability. So anytime I talk about net OPEB liability from here on, it's, it's whichever one's applicable to you. If you have established a trust, then it's net OPEB liability. If you have not, then it's total OPEB liability is what you're going to disclose in the financial statements. So as Mary Beth covered, your first, um, your first responsibility when it comes to the net OPEB liability is to restate to remove the prior net OPEB obligation liability. So take off all your prior balances related to the old GASB. We can't even remember back that far. GASB 45. Seems so long ago, doesn't it? <laughs> As they're coming fast and furious right now. Um, so you remove that prior balance, restate to add the beginning balance of the net OPEB liability, and then record the ending net OPEB liability, and then record OPEB's expense for the difference. That seems pretty simple. How hard could this be, right? Then you get into the fun of deferred inflows and outflows. Because if we stopped back there, wouldn't it be great? We just booked that net OPEB liability. Nope. GASB has that 
new category. Well, it's not so new anymore, but the deferred inflows and outflows of resources, which boy, do they love to include things in each new GASB related to those. So related to the deferred outflows and inflows of resources, you're going to restate to record the beginning deferred outflows related to those contributions after the measurement date. So if your measurement date is anything other than your fiscal year end, you're going to have this deferred outflow balance. And so that one, you're, you are going to restate the beginning balance for that those contributions after the measurement date. So it's anything from your beginning measurement date to your ending measurement date. If there are any contributions, um, and if that measurement date is other than your fiscal year end, that's where you're going to have that number. Then you're going to record the ending deferred outflows for those contributions subsequent to your measurement date, because they're not reflected in your ending balance, right? And then the ending, you're only going to record the ending actuarially determine outflows. So Mary Beth talked about that as well. You're not restating for those balances because you don't have enough information to calculate those beginning deferred actuarially calculated. They're only calculated at the end in this first year. You'll have them gonna go forward. If you all remember back when 68 was implemented, it was the same, it was the same process. You only restate for contributions after the measurement date and the beginning liability number, but not any of the other beginning deferred outflows or inflows. And then the difference your calculated difference, we don't like, you know, auditors don't like to use the word plug. Calculated difference is always the OPEB expense. That's always your go-to to, to balance your entry, okay? So when you talk about the deferred outflows and inflows, there are six at most, which we're going to go over um, each of them, and how, they rep how you report them, how you amortize them, and which ones you should calculate, and then the, the, we'll talk about the layers, it always gets confusing, and then gross presentation versus net presentation in the financial statements. So the first is, uh, so there's, again, there's a maximum of six deferred outflows and inflows that you could report, and, um, but most of the entities are gonna have three, some may have four, four or five. So the first is the differences between expected and actual experience. You're gonna amortize that, and again, these are the actuarially determined ones. These are the, you're going to amortize that over a closed period over the, I, I'm drawing a total blank on what EAR, estimated average remaining service life of the um, EARSL, of the plan participants. And any unamortized balances um, are reported as deferred outflows or inflows as appropriate, separately reported gross. So once you get multiple years, you have, this is a number that you're going to have that first year number, and it's going to get amortized over its EARSL. Then in year two, you'll have a new number related to the differences of expected and actual experience, and that's going to amortize at a different, you know, whatever the applicable EARSL is that year. And any differences, because they can swing both directions depending on what those numbers are and their reported gross. And I'll show you, a, at the end of going through all these details of what the deferred inflows and outflows are, we'll, I'll show you the sample uh, table, what it, what it could look like and what it should look like. The next is the changes of assumptions or other inputs, and it, that's amortized also over the EARSL at the beginning of the measurement, per, measurement period, and any unamortized balances are shown as deferred outflows or inflows separately reported gross. This gross versus net will make sense and right here with this slide. So now the, the deferred inflows or outflows related to the difference between projected and actual earnings on investments, that one is amortized over a closed five-year period and unamortized balances over the multiple years, those are reported net. So you'll only have either a deferred outflow or a deferred outflow inflow depending on what the net number, whether it's a debit or a credit. Now the next two slides are just related to the cost sharing plans. So, the, so if you have an agent or single employer plan, you'll have, you will have the first three deferred inflows or outflows. But these, these next two are only for cost sharing plans, and that's the change in proportionate share. So as the proportionate share of the overall plan changes from year to year, you'll have a calculation of that change in proportionate share, and that gets amortized over, also over the EARSL, and unamortized balances are reported gross. And the difference in actual contributions and the proportionate share of contributions. Uh, those of you that are in the CalPERS cost sharing plans are familiar with these calculations. They're those separate calculations that you, we call those employer calculated amounts because the plan doesn't, calc you, doesn't always, sometimes it does, calculate those um, changes for you. And this one is also reported gross. So then, I don't know, I think you might have to look at your handout to see the details of this. But this is, this presentation is incorrect reporting of the balances. So in this example, 
you can see the contributions sub subsequent to the measurement date, those will always be a deferred outflow. Differences between expected actual experience and the changes of assumptions, those two lines, those are the ones where we say could multiple years could be reported gross. So in year one, you're only gonna have one balance or the other. So this example is in, a, is in the second or third year example, if you happen to have balances that swing. But the net differences of projected and actual earnings on plan investments, notice there are two amounts, one in each column. That's in, inappropriate because that number should be reported net. So that's what the next slide shows you. This is the appropriate, and you can see it could be a big swing. In this inappropriate um, presentation, deferred outflows would be 9.3 million and inflows 3.4 million, but really what it should be is deferred outflows of 6.6 .6 million and deferred inflows of only 783,000 because that plan investment, the deferred inflows and outflows should be netted to report as only either, whichever, again, if it's a debit or a credit, depending on what the net amount is. Clear as mud? Okay. These come from the actuary. Everything except the first one comes from the actuary. Okay. So note disclosures. So again, there's gonna be some redundancy uh, with what was discussed earlier, but we wanna go over um, a little bit. So in addition to the note disclosures currently required for OPEB, so you already have a plan discussion in your financial statements. That's not gonna change. You're not gonna, you're gonna update it for any changes to your plan and your benefits, but the, the, if you think about the first part of your footnote that talks about what the benefits are, who can participate, that's still gonna be intact. And then you're gonna add in, you're gonna take out all the GASB 45 discussion of net OPEB obligation, and you're gonna add in all the GASB 75 disclosures. So in addition to your current disclosures related to the, required to the, wow, related to the plan itself, you're gonna add that re reconciliation of changes in deferred outflows and inflows of resources. You're gonna in, add in the impact of the OPEB liability on a, of a one percentage po point increase or decrease in the discount rate and the healthcare trend rates. So the examples, here's the healthcare cost trend rate se sensitivity. So you can see in the middle, uh, your liability in this example is six million dollars, plus and minus one percent. And as Mary Beth had pointed out, those dis descriptions below this one, this was a very simple one, 9.5 to 5.5. Highly unlikely it's gonna be a simple example like this. It's gonna be more of ranges and examples, um, and you wanna include whatever's in the actuarial report is what you wanna disclose here as far as what the percentage changes are. And then your discount rate sensitivity, it's very similar to what you've, you've seen in the pension, not similar, exactly like what you've seen in the, in the pension disclosure of showing the liability. Again, here it's uh, the net, net OPEB liability, $6 million, plus and minus 1% of the discount rate, and what that impact would be. So in addition, if you have a single or an agent plan, you're required to disclose the effects of the changes during the period on the total OPEB liability. That's that shows the beginning liability and the plan, fiduciary plan net position and then the ending and all of the changes that go into it. Um, and then the fiduciary net position, if applicable, if applicable, again, that's the column that's not required. If you only have a liability, you haven't set up a trust, just by raise of hands, who has not set up a trust? Who's still on a pay go? So we do have a few, because there are, there are definitely I have quite a few clients that have not set up, um, play, set up trusts yet or are still on a pay-as-you-go basis. So any, again, anytime we talk about plan fiduciary net position or net OPEB liability, that you're, you would put in total instead. You're only gonna talk about the total OPEB liability. Even on the face, the face of the financial statements, it'll say total OPEB liability. So one of the other disclosures that are, you're required to include includes the OPEB expense, that what, is, what was the OPEB expense for the year. So OPEB expense is not only everything that goes through your GASB 75 related journal entries where that calculated difference is hitting OPEB expense, you don't wanna forget about also including the fund level contributions because your governmental funds, remember those are on the modified accrual basis, so that still has your actual contributions. Whatever your, contrib your contributions include, premiums paid, plus any contributions to the trust, and if you have a plan where you're also um, making any insurance premiums, but those are pretty rare, but so usually it's just the contributions to the trust plus the plan, the premiums paid to the retirees, and then um, plus your implicit implied subsidy, that number that's coming from the actuarial valuation or the from the actuary 
then your change in net OPEB liability, change in deferred inflows and outflows, and all of those things, that all of those changes are what go in to calculate the total OPEB expense for the note disclosure. Okay. Again, same as what you're doing for the pension side of things. In the required supplementary information, so it includes the following items for the 10 years. So this first year, you're only going to have one year, unless you happen to have implemented 74 last year, where you already have that first year from last year, and you'll keep adding on. So you'll add on until you get to 10 years, just like the regular statistical or other RSI schedules, where you add on until you get 10 years, and then you start going with only 10 years from, there, from, from then on. So the beginning and ending balances of the total OPEB liability and the effects of the changes. So in year one, it's going to be exactly the same as what you're seeing in the um, note disclosure, where you have that table in the footnote and the RSI, they're going to be the same information that first year and, and on the future as well, but not going to be historical in the footnote. Covered payroll, if applicable, or covered employee payroll. Covered employee payroll, as we've been talking about today, is going to be the most common disclosure or amount included. And the ratio of OPEB liability is a percentage of covered payroll or covered employee payroll. The plan's fiduciary net position, if it's a funded plan, and a per, as the, per, the FNP as a percentage of the total OPEB liability, again, if the plan is funded. If your plan is not funded, then you're only going to have that those first, the first information. Then you'll also be required to include a schedule of contributions. So the schedule of contributions Regardless of whether that you have an actuarially determined contribution amount, you will have a, a schedule of contributions. But if you have an actuarially determined contribution amount calculated by the actuary, then that, that schedule is going to include what the ADC is as compared to what your actual contributions are. Okay? And then any contribution deficiency or excess, if there is one. And covered payroll or covered employee payroll, we're getting a little redundant here and the percentage of covered payroll, and then any methods or assumptions. So again, this is very similar to what Mary Beth was showing, and I've got a sample here. So in the next two slides, this example can be, you know, it, because we're try trying to make it readable, have split it onto two slides, but it can be included in one schedule in the financial statements. This is the uh, change in the total OPEB liability and the change in fiduciary net position and the required ratio. So this just shows the change in total OPEB liability, or excuse me, net OPEB liability, and then is followed by those percentages. So since it's on two slides, we've repeated a couple of the numbers here. Then the schedule of contributions. So again, if you don't have an ADC or the actually determined contribution, you're only going to have a schedule of contributions for your 10 years historical information. And then those contributions as a percentage of covered employee payroll. Okay. So the I'm going to go over it again because the, of the question earlier uh, about you know what number should be included. So this covered employee payroll. So does anyone in the room? I don't remember if we if this question was asked earlier. Does anyone in the room have OPEB benefits that are provided as a percentage of pay? Okay, so everyone has that. It's just a flat amount, either premiums or some other flat amount that's provided as a benefit. So in that case, everyone in the room is going to be using that covered employee payroll number. If you think of it, it's, it's not your, your covered payroll would be your, if you think of it, pensionable or OPEBable. Because you do, yours are not based on a percentage of pay, yours is going to be just gross pay. As Mary Beth, it's going to include gross pay, salaries, overtime, any other gross pay numbers that go into, into it for the participants, the plan participants. So, you know, you're probably not going to include any part-time, uh, you know, any, any groups that, are, that aren't Subject to the plan, you would pull that out. As long as it's a number, you want to think of it as the number that's reasonable, close to uh, what your active number and who's participating in the plan. Okay. So this again says the same thing. Covered employees, the total payroll of employees that are provided with OPEB through the um, OPEB plan. Gross pay. Yes? Ooh. That's a really good question. It doesn't address that, I don't think. I don't remember seeing anything in the Q&A. Hmm. So, but they're still going to be included. If, are they included in your plan? Hmm. Are unvested, that, would, that might be an actuary. Because if you think about it, you want to things, make things comparable. So it might be a discussion with the actuary. What does the actuary include in those numbers? Is it, in, is it included if an unvested employee 
does the estimate assume they're going to be there? Okay, so the estimate, okay, Mary Beth is nodding. So the, the question is whether um, the covered employee payroll would include unvested employees because they may not vest for a year. So the liability that's calculated by the actuary does include, it assumes they're going to be there after that year and forecasts it forward. Okay. Okay, so someone that could possibly ever be covered. So again, if we look at, look at reasonableness and you explain what, you know, what are we including and as long as it's consistent from year to year, we include everybody that's eligible, exclude anybody that's ineligible, you know, and, and they're even if they're eligible after the year, and as long as you're consistent from year to year and it makes sense. Because you don't want, you know, you think about you're looking for ratios. So if your payroll is going like this because you're including or excluding a group when you're in the not, but your contributions are going constant, that would affect the percentage. So as long as you're including the same basis every year and not excluding anything inappropriately, it would make sense. So journal entries. So this schedule, I'm not going to actually go over these journal entries because it's more for you as a resource because the journal entries, um, this is more in a columnar format. Um, I like the journal entries in the white paper that Mary Beth was going over. So if you think about the, that you have two versions of your journal entries, you want to segregate them into two types. You have your actuarially calculated amounts. So they are what they are, right? You take them off the actuarial valuation or actuarial report. Uh, or accounting valuation, whatever number is showing your liability at the measurement date and your deferred inflows and outflows at the measurement date, those you're going to record. And then you have the employer calculated amounts. So the employer calculated amounts are the contributions after the measurement date. Because again, your actuarial valuation, depending on the timing of it and what, the, what your measurement date is, that might not include your contributions after the measurement date, right? So that's your employer calculated amount. You know what you con contributed to the plan after that measurement date. And then the other two are the um, deferred inflows and outflows that are related to the cost sharing plans that may not be included in the actuarial valuation. So those are employer calculated amounts. So that's what this table is to help you determine which ones and where your resource and where to get those, uh, those amounts. Okay. And that's where, and also the little additional notes on the component, report debits and credits gross or report debits and credits net. So if you look at the, the uh, one, two, three, four, fifth one down or third from the bottom, report debits and credits net on the statement of net position. So that's showing you which ones are reported gross versus net presentation when you have multiple numbers from multiple years. So the journal entries and the effect on OPEB expense. So this is the effect after, and you don't want to forget your, this is the effect on OPEB expense, but your actual OPEB expense is also going to include your fund level expenses or contributions. Okay, and then this is, the, again, the effect on OPEB expense on the change of assumptions and all of the uh, numbers that go through there. So you can track through the numbers, but I think the, the exercise earlier was a little better to do that with. Okay. Any questions as we go forward from this? Okay. So closing checklist request. You know us auditors, we love to ask for information. You're all going to have it ready to go, right? <laughs> if not yesterday, you've already predicted what we're going to ask this year, right? <laughs> So uh, the closing checklist requests that we're going to include this year include, of course, we need the actuarial valuation. Whichever actuarial valuation was used to calculate your total OPEB liability as of the measurement date. So whether it's the one that's actually, you know, if it's the same thing, if you have an actuarial valuation that, let's say your measurement date is June 38, 2018, and you have a fresh off the presses actuarial valuation as of June 30, 18, so we're only going to need one document, right, because it should have everything you need to record your, what you've used to record your liability, deferred inflows and outflows. But if you have one that's dated June 30, 17, and you're still having a measurement date of June 30, 18, so we need that actual evaluation, and we need the roll forward. So it just depends on what, what information you're, depending on your measurement date and your actuarial valuation. So that's what we're going to request. Then we will need, if different, again, that's the GASB 75 valuation, if it's different than the actual actuarial valuation. And then the census data. We need the census data, again, related to the valuation that was used to calculate your total OPEB liability. And we'll also be requesting the prior census data file, because that's where we'll be using the wonders of Excel to calculate differences between the two to see what the major differences are. And we're going to be asking questions about those. So you want to have a rec and then you also want to have a reconciliation of your census data to the actual evaluation. Okay. And any causes, 
we talked about earlier, any causes for significant changes. Number, of, you know, large number of retirements, a large hiring, um, layoffs, uh, changes in benefits, things like that. We'll also be asking for active, retiree, and inactive information. So that's going to be where we're going to pick our samples from. Right? We're going to select samples from that information uh, and be picking samples and needing the personnel files or other supporting documentation to support the information uh, that's included in the census data. We'll also need current year contribution information. So some of this, these requests might be done at inter, during the interim audit, but others are going to be waiting for year end when you actually have your actual contribution information. And then covered employee payroll, you're going to need to disclose that information, so we're going to be asking for that number. And then the basis for allocation between governmental activities by department and enterprise funds and if internal service funds if you're also going to allocate the liability and the deferred inflows and outflows to the internal service funds. So we're we'll asking for the basis for that. How did you determine to make your allocation? Does it, is it reasonable? We're going to be testing it for reasonableness and supporting documentation. Then it keeps going. Our closing checklists get longer and longer with the GASBs, if you haven't noticed. Okay, so we'll also be asking for a list of status changes that you reported to the plan. Um, any plan audit information. So if you're in CERBT or PARS or other, we're going to be asking for that information if it's not available on the website. CERBT does post that information to their website, but PARS does not. So you actually have to request the information. It's, it's available, or it should be available in, I think this year it's going to be available October-ish, and PARS will provide it to you, but you have to request it from them. I don't know, I don't know if there's going to be a change since this is now the second year, if they'll just automatically provide it to you, but you want to start asking those questions in case they do have a mailing list that they'll be sending if you're in the PARS plan so that you have that when it's available. And then they should, if they have the, that's where PARS has the SOC 1 type 2 report or an examination or audit report. Whatever information the plan has, you want to be getting that data prior to year end so you have that available for the audit. And if you, your trust statements as of the fiscal year end, we'll be asking for those statements as well. As of the, so we want the, the trust statements as of the valuation date and as of the fiscal year end. And then we'll be asking for a payroll register during, you know, from XXX, such as the last pay period in the month before the valuation date. That's where we're picking those newly eligible employees. We're looking for, and, and also picking active employees for eligibility in the plan. And we're testing in both directions. Think about we're testing from census data to your files, and then we're testing from payroll records to the census data. So, so are people in there that should be? Are people, people that should be in there in there? If, are people that are in there that shouldn't be, and vice versa? Uh, and any other client? specific or plan specific data, you know, we'll also be looking at MOUs. I think most of you by these days have um, the MOUs are available on your website, so we usually don't need to request copies of those from you. But if for some if they're not posted to your website, we're requesting the MOUs so we can uh, test that the plan information is uh, what's reported in the actual evaluation and in your note disclosure, it reflects what's actually in the MOUs or your other plan documentation. And then this last bullet is actually related to, um, it's just an FYI, it's not related to the closing checklist. If you remember back when you implemented statement um, 68, in your MDNA, we suggested that you not restate the prior column because you don't have the information necessary to restate all the way back to the beginning of July, or of June 30, 16. You have the information to restate as of July 1, 17, but you don't have the data to restate back to July 1, or July 1, 16, so that's why you don't restate that prior year column. So the numbers will not be comparative this year, but you can include the same note disclosure that you would have included in the MDNA back when 68 was implemented, which, what was that, three, four years ago now? I don't even, I can't remember the number. Um, so that's going to happen again this year. And that's it. Any questions? Because here's some resources. Because you all want to read the implementation guide and the statements themselves. I know, I know that's what you want to do. And the CCMA white paper, here's the link to that white paper that Mary Beth went over. Uh, it is a really good resource that has that sample note disclosure, the journal entries, and all that information that you could use to put that together. And then, of course, ask your auditors as well. And here's the CERBT link and PARS, but again, PARS does not post the information to their website. You might be able to get into it, but us auditors can't.
Any other questions? All right, great, thank you.